Assalamu alaikum. I hope you are uh, well and safe. Uh, in today's session, I'm going to discuss the cardiovascular adjustments in exercise. We know very well that uh, during exercise, the mechanical work that is performed by the skeletal muscles uh, requires continuous uh, supply of uh, energy in the form of ATP. And the uh, continuous requirement for that ATP uh, uh, mandates or requires some adjustments in the cardiovascular system because we know very well that the cardiovascular system ensures continuous supply of nutrients and oxygen so the muscles are having enough energy during uh, the performance of that session of exercise. First of all, objectives uh, we are going to discuss how pulmonary oxygen uptake is increased during exercise and this uptake is increased uh, during the performance of certain types of exercise and we'll see that in the slides and also we are going to describe the receptors involved in the cardiorespiratory adjustments to the exercise we are going to understand the role of central and autonomic nervous systems and exercise how they are going uh, to, to control the cardiovascular system and also the respiratory system to ensure the continuous supply of oxygen and nutrients and also we are going to describe the changes that happen or that are going to happen in the stroke volume and heart rate and how they are induced and also we are going to know uh, whether stroke volume or heart rate are the main contributor to the increase of cardiac output that occurs during exercise. Also, we are going to des describe the changes in blood pressure in relation to the type of exercise because we have at least two different types of exercise, the isotonic and isometric, and we will see that there are the, or the changes in blood pressure are different in isotonic and isometric types of exercise. And finally, we will discuss the long-term cardiovascular, autonomic and muscular changes induced by endurance training, how training will affect the cardiovascular system, the autonomic nervous system and the, the trained muscles. As we know very well or as we discussed in the first lectures of the cardiovascular module that at rest the cardiac output is uh, on average 5 liters per minute and those 5 liters are uh, distributed in different percentages to the different organs of the body. Uh, we know very well that 20% of the cardiac output goes to the internal viscera at rest and about 20% to the kidneys and 20% to the skeletal muscles at rest. We are talking about uh, cardiac output and its distribution and rest and about 4 to 5% is going to the heart in the form of coronary blood flow. And as we know that 20% uh, of the 5 liters per minute of the cardiac output at rest, which is 5 liters per minute, goes to the skeletal muscle, which means that muscles or skeletal muscles receive about 1 liter of uh, cardiac output uh, or 1 liter per minute. If we assume or if we, uh, we know very well that cardiac output increases between three to four times in non-trained people and five to seven times in trained athletes. Let's say that cardiac output increases about five times on average, five times uh, during heavy exercise. So this means that the cardiac output will become 25 liters per minute during heavy exercise. This dramatic increase in the cardiac output is meant to supply the uh, skeletal muscles that are involved in the uh, in the work or in the mechanic or the performance of exercise which means that the exercising muscles will receive about 20 liters per minute so the skeletal muscles during heavy exercise will receive about 80 percent of the cardiac output and this represents 20 liters per minute we can notice here that the percentage of uh, coronary blood flow is four to five percent out of the uh, cardiac output. It is the same percentage as, as rest, but it is five times higher because the cardiac output is five times higher. So if we take 5% out of the 25 liters per minute, it will be five times higher than the 5% that is taken out of five liters per minute at rest.
okay so from this slide we can notice that during heavy exercise the blood flow to the skeletal muscles that are involved in the exercise is about 20 times the resting blood flow so during exercise there is an increase in the energy demand that will be proportional to the number and size of the involved muscles of the involved skeletal muscles and this uh, is translated by the increase in the blood flow that is 20 times uh, the blood flow at rest uh, the energy supply to the exercising muscle is in different ways so the first uh, line of energy supply is the free ATP that is present in the cytosol or the, uh, in the, in the cytosol of the skeletal muscle once this uh, ATP is depleted then the second line will come into action which is the phosphocreatine phosphocreatine is a form of storage of energy in the muscle it easily releases the phosphorus to be uh, bound to the ATP so we can regenerate ATP within the first few seconds after the onset of exercise if the phosphocreatine is uh, depleted then the glycogen that is stored in the skeletal muscle will release glucose glucose will be converted to lactic acid and this will generate two ATP so glucose um, forming two pyruvate and then the two pyruvate will give me the two lactate or two lactic acid molecules this uh, chemical reaction will generate two ATP so this is another source of uh, ATP after the depletion of phosphocreatine in other types of muscles or depending on the type of muscles and the availability of oxygen if oxygen is available to the skeletal muscle then that oxygen will be used to aerobically metabolize glucose fatty acids and amino acids that are uh, supplied to the muscles by the its blood flow and this will release large amount of atp as we know from biochemistry and with the formation of carbon dioxide water and urea if amino acids are the source of that energy uh, as I said aerobic metabolism will release large amount of ATP but this system is a bit or relatively slower compared to the phosphocreatine and glycogen lactic acid system so in terms of amount of ATP that is released per minute because exercising muscles needs ATP at a high rate the fast uh, or the fastest system that can release ATP is phosphagen system phosphagen system is the system that is composed of free ATP in the cytosol of the skeletal muscle and the phosphocreatine that is present in the cytosol so the phosphagen system is able to release four ATP molecules per minute uh, so four, 4 ATP or moles of ATP per minute which is quite fast compared to the other systems the glycogen lactic acid system that I explained here in the figure on the right side of the slide can release 2.5 moles of ATP per minute while the aerobic system that uses glucose fatty acids and amino acids can only provide one mole of ATP per minute so if we have an exercise or a type of exercise that requires large amount of ATP at very high rate then the phosphagen system and glycogen lactic acid system are um, ideal to supply ATP for that type of exercise if we have low intensity exercise and prolonged exercise like in during marathon running then aerobic acid system is ideal to supply ATP at that low pace of ATP release okay however although phosphagen system and glycogen lactic acid system can supply ATP at high rate but they have or the, phos the phosphagen system and glycogen lactic acid system are depleted quickly we have limited stores of these two systems the phosphagen system can provide ATP uh, that is enough for doing exercise for 8 to 10 seconds which is running or sprinting at very high speed for 100 meter 
and this usually lasts for 10 seconds so phosphagen system is enough just to run for 10 seconds as we see in the, in the lowest part of the slide glycogen lactic acid system can provide energy or ATP for exercise that lasts between 1.3 to 1.5 minutes so it, it is a source of energy for exercise that lasts uh, for about 1.5 minutes or about 90 seconds then if we want a longer exercise like uh, marathon running for 10 kilometers or so then the aerobic uh, system is ideal because it can provide ATP for unlimited time as long as the cardiovascular system is supplying enough amount of oxygen and nutrients to the exercising muscles okay let's uh, have what i explained in words to perform exercise muscle cells obtain energy from number one atp that is present free in the muscle as i said this atp is sufficient to sustain maximal muscle activity for three seconds and then the phosphocreatine creatine system it is two to four times as much or our muscles contain two to four times as much phosphocreatine as ATP so the phosphocreatine uh, store in our skeletal muscles is about on average three times the amount of free ATP in the cytosol and uh, what is uh, good that the energy transfer from phosphocreatine to ATP is very fast it occurs within very small fraction of a second so it is very fast in transferring energy to replenish or regenerate ATP that was used in the first few seconds of the exercise. Then we have the glycogen lactic acid system. Glycogen stored in muscle will split into glucose. Glucose will give me two biovate molecules. This in turn will give me two lactic acid molecules. And the entire process will generate two ATP uh, molecules per glucose molecule. The lactic acid will diffuse out of the skeletal muscle cell into the interstitial fluid and blood. It is, its diffusion into the interstitium will cause vasodilation of the blood vessels supplying that muscle. And if it accumulates in large amount, it will cause the pain that happens after exercise or during exercise and even after exercise. The accumulation of lactic acid will cause the fatigue and the pain that will happen after the exercise then the aerobic system we said the oxidation of foodstuffs in the mitochondria to release large amounts of energy that are used to convert AMP ADP into ATP the combined amounts of cell ATP the free ATP and cell phosphocreatine are called the phosphagen energy system we also call them the alactic anaerobic system or source of energy because we have a lactic acid source and the or lactic uh, anaerobic source which is number three and the phosphagen system can also called a lactic anaerobic source or system this can provide maximum muscle power for eight to ten seconds which is almost enough to run at maximum speed for 10 meters as i said in the previous slide now what are the types of exercise exercise can be can be divided uh, or classified according to the how the or whether there is a change in muscle length during the exercise and also can be classified or divided on how oxygen is consumed during the exercise session according to changes in muscle length we have one type of exercise called dynamic exercise or rhythmic exercise why it is called dynamic or rhythmic because this type of exercise involves rhythmic cycles of contraction and relaxation so the muscle length is changing continuously or in a cyclic way throughout the exercise like running muscles will contract and relax so these are cyclic changes that's why we call dynamic or rhythmic exercise Another type of exercise called static exercise or isometric exercise. Isometric means there is no change 
in the muscle length during uh, exercise. So the muscle tension is increasing, but there is no change in the muscle length. And the best example for isometric or uh, static exercise is weight lifting. Okay. Then, according to the way of oxygen consumption, and it is a very common way of classifying exercise, and I think every one of you know that way of classifying exercise, is aerobic exercise. This type of exercise requires or consumes oxygen continuously, so it requires continuous supply of oxygen to the exercising muscles, and we have anaerobic exercise. This type of exercise uh, doesn't require uh, oxygen while performing the exercise. So it depends on anaerobic systems. And based on the previous explanation, or the explanation in the previous slides, anaerobic exercise mainly depends on the phosphagen system and the glycogen lactic acid system as a source of ATP for performing that exercise. Okay? Uh, different types of exercises are performed by different muscle fibers. Uh, uh, muscle itself is composed of mixture of muscle fibers. And that mixture uh, of muscle fibers, we have dominance for certain type of fibers uh, uh, compared to the uh, uh, muscles that are involved in other types of exercise. And if we examine uh, muscle, it contains a mixture of uh, red, muscle fibers, or we call them slow twitch muscle fibers, and white uh, muscle fibers, and we call them fast twitch muscle fibers. Okay, so any muscle in the body is cont uh, contains a combination of these, and the amount of red or white, or which one is higher, depends on the type of the exercise the, that, uh, that the muscle can perform, or the, the respective muscle can perform. So what are the difference between slow twitch or red fibers against or versus the fast twitch or white muscle fibers? Uh, aerobic exercise is performed by the slow twitch muscle fibers or the red muscle fibers. They have small diameter, okay? And uh, somebody asked me during the webinar, uh, last week why they have smaller uh, diameter they have smaller diameter because they need uh, they have extensive uh, blood supply as we'll see in the coming lines and the extensive blood supply uh, and also their requirement for oxygen is high so smaller fibers uh, means that we have a short uh, distance for diffusion of oxygen so the oxygen can reach uh, the entire cytoplasm in a short time okay so the small diameter ensures they get oxygen in an efficient way that is coming from the blood vessels supplying the muscles and also the fibers could be smaller because they usually perform a low intensity exercise or low intensity work okay they have dark color because they contain large amount of myoglobin myoglobin is a protein uh, similar to hemoglobin present in the cytoplasm of skeletal muscles and this it stores oxygen in the muscle uh, fiber so it is a store a form of oxygen storage in the muscle that will be used in the initial uh, seconds of the exercise until the supply is coming through the blood vessels they have numerous mitochondria because this type of muscle fiber depends mainly on aerobic metabolism that requires the presence of mitochondria. Uh, the red muscle fibers or slow twitch muscle fibers have low glycogen content. They don't depend on glycogen lactic acid system as a source of energy. They also metabolize fatty acids and proteins which are broken down into acetyl-CoA so uh, they both can enter uh, the uh, Krebs cycle through the acetyl-CoA. They have extensive blood supply, so the muscle fibers are surrounded by many capillaries that ensure the provision of oxygen and nutrients during the exercise. The slow twitch muscle fibers that are responsible for the aerobic exercise, they, they are responsible for prolonged activities, but at lower intensity. And as I said, the best example is marathon running. We run 
at a moderate speed so we perform uh, low intensity activities and we can run for long distances so prolonged activity uh, fuel that is needed by these muscles or that is a source of energy for those muscles is stored in muscles in adipose tissue and liver okay and the major fuels used by these slow twitch muscle fibers vary with the intensity and the duration of the exercise during the early uh, session uh, glucose is the main source of energy and later on with longer activity the free fatty acids will become the main source of energy because glucose concentration will start to fall in the blood example of aerobic exercise is long distance uh, running and swimming anaerobic exercise is performed by fast twitch muscle fibers they have large diameter they have about diameter twice uh, the diameter of red muscle fibers they are light in color that's why we call them white muscle fibers because they have low myoglobin content they are anaerobic they don't depend on oxygen stored in the cytosol of the skeletal muscle they have relatively few mitochondria because they depend mainly on anaerobic metabolism and this anaerobic metabolism doesn't require the presence of mitochondria they have high glycogen content because they depend mainly as i said on the phosphagen and glycogen lactic acid system as a source of energy surrounded by fewer capillaries they are responsible for short duration activities with great intensity like sprinting or running at maximal speed for 100 meter the energy is supplied by creatine phosphate and glycogen from the muscle or the glycogen that is stored in the muscle examples of anaerobic exercise is sprinting which is running over a short distance at top speed and weight lifting now what happens or how oxygen consumption and pulmonary ventilation change during exercise oxygen consumption increases in aerobic type of exercise and this requires increasing the pulmonary ventilation to meet the oxygen demands or the increased oxygen demands so the respiratory ability is of little importance in the performance of sprint type of exercise so the respiratory ability is of little importance in anaerobic exercise but it is very critical for maximal performance in endurance exercise the normal oxygen consumption for a young man body weight about 70 kg at rest is 200 50 milliliter per minute so uh, an average man consumes about quarter liter per minute of oxygen and this oxygen comes from the respiratory system due to the pulmonary ventilation and the gas exchange that happens across the respiratory membrane under maximal conditions this consumption can be increased up to 20 times okay so the 250 50 ml per minute can reach up to 5,000 milliliter per minute, about five liters of oxygen consumption per liter during maximal or vigorous exercise. What are the limits of pulmonary ventilation during exercise? Do we stop our exercise because we reached our maximal limit of pulmonary ventilation? This is a question or a common question. The answer is no, because if we are sitting in a lab and we are doing spirometry, there is something called the maximal breathing capacity. We ask the uh, person who is doing the test to breathe his vital capacity as fast as he can. And usually it has a value of 150 to 170 liters per minute in a normal healthy subject what is the maximal pulmonary ventilation during maximal exercise it is 100 to 110 liters per minute so still we have about 50 percent reserve so what stops us from doing aerobic exercise is not the pulmonary ventilation is not because we have reached 
our limit of pulmonary ventilation. The limiting factor we'll see in the coming slide comes from the cardiovascular system. So the respiratory system in terms of pulmonary ventilation is not usually the limit for aerobic type of exercise. As you see here, oxygen consumption increases from uh, 250 ml uh, per, per minute. It can reach up to 5 liters and this in will in uh, will, uh, is the result of an increase in the total ventilation, total pulmonary ventilation with exercise that can reach levels up to 110. As I'm explaining here on the figure on the right side of the slide. Now, what happens to the oxygen diffusing capacity and blood gases during exercise? I think you got a tutorial in the respiratory system explaining the concept of lung uh, diffusing capacity for oxygen. The lung diffusing capacity for oxygen will increase. Diffusing capacity means uh, how, what is the amount of oxygen can, that can diffuse across the respiratory membrane uh, per unit time. The lung diffusing capacity for oxygen increases during exercise because the entire lung becomes zone 3 during exercise. From physiology or respiratory physiology, we know that there are three zones in the lung. Zone 1, zone 2, and zone 3. Zone 1, there is no perfusion. There is no perfusion of the pulmonary capillaries. Zone 2, there is perfusion only during systole and there is no perfusion during diastole. Zone three, there is continuous perfusion of pulmonary capillaries throughout the cardiac cycle. Normally, in a normal person, the zone one doesn't exist in the lungs. Zone two is present in the upper part on the apical region of the lungs, and zone three is present in the middle and lower part of the lung. So in a normal resting person, he has zone 2 in the epices of the lungs and zone 3 in the middle and lower regions during exercise the entire lung will become zone 3 why because the cardiac output that increased five times will open all the pulmonary capillaries so there is continuous blood flow through the pulmonary capillaries throughout the cardiac cycle so the entire lungs become zone 3 so the diffusing capacity for oxygen uh, at for non-athletes or non-trained people at rest is 23 milliliters per minute in in non-trained athletes and during maximal exercise it goes up to 448 milliliter per minute which is almost double but with trained athletes or swimmers or trained swimmers during maximal exercise it can go up to three times so the diffusion of oxygen across the respiratory membrane doubles or triples during maximal exercise depending on whether we are talking about non-trained subject or trained athlete. The blood gases usually do not change during exercise in a healthy person. So we don't depend on changes in blood gases to change uh, the respiratory and cardiovascular system function. Why? Because usually the signal that is coming from the precentral gyrus and the motor cortex of the cerebral cortex, the fibers or motor fibers that are innervating the muscles that will perform the exercise, also some of the fibers will go to the respiratory system and cardiovascular center in the middle of longata. So both the respiratory center and cardiovascular centers will be stimulated simultaneously. So they will start to increase their activities before there is any change in the blood gases. Okay, so blood gases usually do not become abnormal during exercise to stimulate respiration. Why? Because respiration is stimulated mainly by neurogenic mechanism during exercise via two mechanisms. One of them, I already explained, direct stimulation of the respiratory center by the same nervous signals that are transmitted from the brain to the muscles uh, to cause the exercise. As I said, some fibers will go to the respiratory center and will activate the respiratory center. So this will ensure that blood gases will not 
or oxygen will not become low during exercise. Another signal or another neurogenic signal comes from the proprioceptors present in the muscles and moving joints that will send feedback to the respiratory uh, center present in the medulla oblongata and pons. Okay. Now, what are the cardiovascular or what is the cardiovascular response uh, to exercise at rest? As I explained in the first slide, uh, skeletal muscles receive only a small fraction of the cardiac output. It is about 20% or one liter per minute. If the cardiac output is five liter per minute. In dynamic exercise, or in aerobic exercise, the percentage of cardiac output directed to working skeletal muscle increases dramatically. It reaches up uh, to 80% of the cardiac output, which is 25 liters per minute, which means the muscles will receive 20 liters per minute. Local control of blood flow will ensure that only working muscles with, with increased metabolic demands will receive the increased blood flow, which is 20 to 25 times the resting rates. And this will ensure the delivery of adequate amount or enough amount of oxygen that is necessary to run the aerobic metabolism. Okay, so only the exercising muscles will receive the extra blood uh, supply due to the uh, release of local vasodilators by the exercising muscles. Internal viscera, non-exercising muscles, there will be low blood flow due to the increase in the sympathetic system activity as we'll see in the coming slides. Example, if the uh, legs alone are active, leg muscle blood flow will increase, whereas the arm muscle blood flow remain, uh, remains unchanged or even reduced due to the effect of the sympathetic system. Here we have an example. The resting blood flow of uh, muscle is 3.6 milliliter of blood per 100 gram uh, of muscle, muscle mass per minute. During maximum activity, this uh, blood flow can increase up to 90 milliliter per 100 gram of muscle. Here we can see in this figure on the right side of the slide, we have an increase in blood flow to the calf muscles during running or during rhythmic exercise. Uh, you can see that there is fluctuation in the blood flow. It is not a line, clear line. The, there is an increase and a decrease during the exercise. This is attributed by the contraction of the muscle. The contracting muscle will compress the blood vessels supplying the skeletal muscle and this will reduce the blood flow and then the relaxation of muscle will, will be followed by an increase in blood flow and so on. So also uh, in rhythmic ex exercise, the blood flow to the exercising muscle is not stable. It is up and down going into cycles due to the compression of the blood vessels by the contract muscle. So the cardiovascular response to exercise uh, involves the uh, involves systemic regulation and involves local regulation. The systemic regulation is meant or is done via this cardiovascular center in the brainstem uh, with the uh, autonomic nervous system output to the heart and the systemic resistant vessels. And this will be in the form of CNS as well as autonomic nervous system. So what happens? Similar to the respiratory system, initially the motor cortex is activated. So the total neural activity roughly proportional to the muscle mass and its work intensity will communicate or some fibers from the motor cortex will communicate with the uh, cardiovascular uh, systems control center in the medulla. This will decrease the vagal tone of the heart or the vagal tone on the heart a decrease in the vagal tone means an increase in the heart rate. Also, this will cause resetting of the arterial baroreceptor to a higher level. So if the arterial baroreceptors are set to a certain value of mean arterial pressure, now the set point will become much higher. So the blood pressure will increase or the homeostatic system of the body will work hard to achieve the new set point which is higher than the 
resting set point of the arterial baroreceptors. The autonomic nervous system also has a say uh, during this cardiovascular control. As work rate is increased further, lactic acid will accumulate. I said lactic acid that is produced will accumulate in the interstitium of the exercising muscle. Chemoreceptors in the uh, present on the sensory fibers innervating the skeletal muscles will be stimulated by this lactic acid and send impulses to the cardiovascular center in the brainstem. This will increase the sympathetic outflow. Sympathetic outflow to the heart and systemic resistant vessels mean an increase in heart rate, increase in stroke volume, and increase in total peripheral resistance. This uh, reflex arc that is stimulated by lactic acid and uh, results in stimulation or increase in the sympathetic outflow is called muscle chemo reflex. So the muscle chemo reflex will change the sympathetic outflow through the autonomic nervous system. The local regulation is uh, responsible for the cardiovascular response in the exercising muscle. It happens only in actively working muscles. A decrease in oxygen, an increase in nitric oxide, increase in vasodilator prostanoids, increase in local vasoactive factors like adenosine, an increase in lactate, and an increase in potassium, all of them lead to or result in the dilatation of arterioles supplying those skeletal muscles despite the rising sympathetic vasoconstrictor tone. So the exercising muscle, the local factors will override the sympathetic vasoconstrictor response that is controlling the non-exercising muscles. Increased sympathetic vasoconstrictor tone in the renal and the internal viscera, vascular beds, and in inactive muscles, we reduce blood flow to these tissues by about 75% if we are, we are doing strength exercise. Now, what are the changes that happen in stroke volume and heart rate during exercise? And which one will contribute to the five times or seven times increase in cardiac output? Both of them will increase during exercise, but one of them will increase much more compared to the other. So during maximal activity, like in marathon running, stroke volume increases about 50%. So if the resting stroke volume is 105 milliliter uh, per beat, it can go up to 162 milliliter per beat. So the stroke volume can increase up to 50%. On the other hand, heart rate can increase up to 270 percent. So if the resting heart rate in a trained athlete is 50 beats per minute, it can go up to 185 beats per minute. As you can see here in this figure, in the slide, that the 50 percent increase in stroke volume happens midway. If the maximal cardiac output during exercise is 25 and the resting 5 here, the value is wrong. So here at 15 liters per minute, which is midway, the uh, stroke volume had reached the plateau. And any uh, further change in cardiac output beyond the midpoint of the maximal cardiac output is contributed by the heart rate. So stroke volume normally reaches its maximum by the time the cardiac output has increased only halfway to its maximum any further increase in cardiac output occurs by increasing the heart rate as we see here in this green light of the line of the figure therefore the increase in heart rate accounts for a greater proportion of the increase in cardiac output during exercise compared with the increase in stroke volume so the main contributor to the increase in cardiac output is the heart rate not the stroke now what happens to the blood pressure during exercise? The change, uh, the blood pressure will increase during exercise, but whether we have an increase in both systolic and diastolic or only an increase in systolic, it depends on the type of exercise. So in dynamic exercise, 
as we can see here in the figure on the right side of the slide we can see that systolic blood pressure in dynamic exercise increases and diastolic blood pressure does not increase so systolic blood pressure can go up to 150 to 170 millimeter mercury diastolic blood pressure as can be seen here in the graph it is almost flat is hardly altered in isometric exercise like running uh, sorry like uh, weightlifting systolic blood pressure can increase to very high levels up to 250 millimeter mercury and also the systolic blood pressure can reach values uh, up to 180 millimeter mercury which is even higher than the systolic blood pressure of dynamic exercise why we have this uh, difference between dynamic exercise and isometric exercise the main point is the compression or continuous compression of blood vessels supplying the skeletal muscle during isometric exercise the continuous compression of the blood vessels means the accumulation of metabolites like lactic acid lactic acid will stimulate chemo uh, reflex or chemoreceptor reflex and this will reset the arterial bar receptor to higher point so the homeostatic mechanism will try to keep blood pressure at high levels that will meet the new uh, set point so why this difference in isometric exercise there is continuous or the muscle blood flow increases uh, relative to the resting condition but the sustained muscle contraction will compress the intramuscular arteries this will decrease oxygen delivery to the contracting muscle this will lead to rapid accumulation of lactic acid and this in turn will stimulate the muscle chemoreflex this will lead to the resetting or elevation of the bar receptor set point and sympathetic drive and this results in an increase in both systolic and diastolic blood pressure to very high levels that will meet the new set point higher mean the blood pressure as compared with the dynamic exercise so during isometric exercise blood pressure is much higher than during dynamic exercise so if we know a pre-hypertensive patient or hypertensive patient we don't advise him to do isometric exercise because this will put him at high risk we advise him to do dynamic exercise low intensity exercise at uh, for longer period this will help him but isometric exercise will put him at risk to have very very high blood pressure with all the consequences okay now what is the effect of endurance training on muscles what will happen to the muscle when we train that muscle well, for example when we go to the gym so with the training muscle becomes hypertrophied the hypertrophy is due to an increase in the diameter of the muscle not an increase in the number of the fibers so the muscle fibers or the number of the muscle fibers is the same but we are increasing the size of each muscle fiber or each muscle cell the increase in muscle fiber size is due to increase in the number of myofibrils present inside the muscle fiber these are the contractile proteins present inside the muscle cell also there is an increase of 120 percent in the mitochondrial enzymes so uh, we know the mitochondria occupy space inside the muscle cell also there is an increase of 60 to 80 percent in the components of the phosphagen metabolic system so we have more atp and more phosphocreatine in the hypertrophied muscle fiber also the muscle fiber can now store more glycogen up to 50 percent higher amount of glycogen compared to non-trained muscle fat. also there is an increase of between 75 to 100 percent in the triglycerides triglycerides stored in the muscle as a source of energy all of these will increase the maximum oxidation rate and efficiency of the oxidative metabolic system as much as 45 percent if we increase the uh, oxi maximum oxidation rate of the muscle 
This means that we are going to delay the lactate production and accumulation by the exercising muscle. So me, this less uh, lactate production means less uh, chemoreflex influence on the cardiovascular system. This will increase the vagal tone and decrease the sympathetic activity. And in turn, both of these will lower the resting blood pressure and heart rate that we see in trained people. Why? Because they, they have less accumulation of lactic acid, less production, less accumulation of lactic acid by the, in the trained muscles. So now the chemoreflex uh, is uh, having less influence on the cardiovascular system. This will increase the vagal tone, decrease the, the sympathetic activity or sympathetic or the vasomotor tone and this will result in lower resting blood pressure and uh, lower heart rate. Therefore, uh, endurance athlete can achieve maximal cardiac output, which is 40% greater than that achieved by untrained person. For example, if the maximal cardiac output of trained person is uh, 20 liters per minute during maximal activity uh, the, the trained athlete can increase it up to uh, 28 liters or 30 liters per minute which is about 40 percent higher than the non-trained subject this uh, 40 percent uh, increase in cardiac output is mainly due to an increase in the heart mass the size of the uh, or the thickness of the muscle wall will increase in trained athletes due to the increase in the enlargement of the chambers of the heart, especially the ventricles and hypertrophy of its wall. This will lead to a 40 to 50 percent increase in heart pumping effectiveness, but there is a corresponding decrease in heart rate. Though the heart is able to pump more blood during uh, systole, so the stroke volume is high, but due to the less influence of the chemo reflex, so we have lower resting heart rate. So the resting cardiac output of trained athlete and non-trained subject are exactly the same. The difference appears during maximal activity. Even though the heart of the marathoner or the trained athlete is co considerably larger than that of the normal person, resting cardiac output is almost the same as that in the no normal non-trained subject. However, this normal cardiac output is achieved by large stroke volume at reduced heart rate because low heart rate means uh, uh, longer filling time and longer filling time means we have more preload so this will increase the stroke volume. So if we take this here, uh, this table in the slide, we have a resting person, his stroke volume is 75 milliliter and his heart rate is 75 beats per minute. So the cardiac output is almost 5000 milliliter per minute. The trained athlete or the marathoner, his uh, resting stroke volume is 105 and his resting heart rate is 50 beats per minute and his cardiac output at rest is 5 liters per minute or 5000 ml per minute. So they have almost the same cardiac output at rest. But in, during maximum exercise, the non-athlete or non-trained subject, he can reach a maximum stroke volume of 110 and a maximal heart rate of 195. If we multiply them by each other, we get about 20 liters per minute. The marathoner or the trained athletes, his stroke volume can go up to 162% which is about 40% higher the, uh, than the non-trained uh, subject, and his heart rate can go up to 185. The product of his stroke volume and heart rate will be around uh, 30 liters per minute. So the trained athlete uh, during maximal exercise can increase his cardiac output about 40% higher than non-trained subject, and this is mainly due to an increase in the stroke volume that is a result of hypertrophy of the wall of the heart chambers, especially the ventricles. This increased pumping act capacity occur almost entirely 
in the endurance type, not in the sprint type of athlete athletic training. So if we want to increase our pumping capacity, we should do uh, endurance training rather than sprint type training because this has a uh, minimal effect on the pumping capacity of the heart. So uh, just to conclude this uh, session, the respiratory system, as we saw in one of the slide, is not normally the most limiting factor in the delivery of oxygen to the muscles during maximal muscle aerobic metabolism. So the, ex the respiratory system, we said the maximal ventilation during maximal exercise can reach levels up to 110 liters per minute, and maximal breathing capacity is 150 or 170. So still we have reserve. So the respiratory system is not the limit for our aerobic exercise. What is the limit? Is the ability of the heart to pump blood to the muscles is usually a greater limiting factor. And that's why we do endurance training to improve our pumping capacity of the heart so we can get better results during aerobic exercise the references uh, thank you very much for listening to this session and i apologize uh, because the link of the webinar is not present uh, in moodle it is out of my hands and also out of the hands of the it people thank you very much please be safe and goodbye